needed. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may pro proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who have not obtained mercy, but have obtained, but now have obtained mercy. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I ask for forgiveness, Lord, when I take your word for granted, Lord, just how easy and accessible it is for me to read your scripture aloud in front of this congregation or read it at home, Lord, and not be persecuted for my belief, Lord. I just think, Lord, all the different versions that I can read from and just how easily accessible it is to get to your word, Lord, but in my heart today, Lord, it is heavy for those that are truly persecuted, Lord, that have to read this and, and hide, Lord, when they read it or assemble in secret, Lord. I just lift up to you, Lord, all the persecuted Christians, Lord, around the world and all your missionaries, Lord, that uh, share the gospel with others. Lord, I pray now that you be with us during our worship time together, Lord. I just pray that you be with Pastor as he brings forth the words that you want us to hear, Lord. As always, Lord, I pray that we would be not only hearers of these words, but doers of these words, Lord. And I just ask that your spirit would move in a mighty way today, Lord, in this place. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother John. Well, good morning, everyone. If you want to open up with me in a moment, we're going to be in uh, Galatians 5.1. Galatians 5.1, which is page 974 in your pew Bible. I was so tempted to break from what, well not break from, but to preach that passage in 1 Peter 2. It's so powerful. It's, <laughs> but it's the perfect backdrop to where we're going. Uh, we're going to talk about Christian freedom today, and it's important that we understand that Jesus didn't die to give us a license to ill. <laughs> you know, he didn't, he didn't give us freedom to just act a fool. We, we don't, we're not free to just live any old way we want. That's not what he freed us to. It's certainly not what he freed us from. And that passage in Peter is so eloquent in explaining, we were saved to be a holy nation, temple of the living God, a peculiar, a chosen people, set apart to bring glory to the Father, to spread the word of the Lord to the lost and dying world. We have a, a mission, so our freedom isn't freedom to frolic. It's, it's freedom from some things that we're going we're gonna to discuss here in the next few minutes, but it's, it, it's important to know that we're not just free to wander the earth doing whatever we want. We are free. And, and I'd like you to take a look at your bulletin front cover. If you have one handy, I'll hold this one up. I'm alone today, not because, without my wife and my son. Uh, Christina's sick. She sends her regards, and she's got a throat thing and an ear thing that I'm praying she's not giving to me, and she's at home with that. But um, when I look for, even this artwork that I bought for the PowerPoint, when I look for Christian's exercising their freedom and fighting for the faith. I, 
struggle to find pictures of us doing that in community. It's always one person with a Bible, you know, with the sword guy, the spirit man, I guess that's the spirit dude coming out of his back there with the sword. And, um, we're not alone. It, it, all the artwork for Christianity and fighting the good fight and standing firm, it's always one person shielding their child. Or, it's beautiful artwork, but it just isn't indicative of what the gospel says. We're in this together. All of us. Satan picks on one of us, he's got to face all of us. That's how it should be. If one of us is struggling with our child at home, whether it's a matter of salvation or whatever, the, there ought to be a band of people praying for that parent, not just one. You know, it's not just that parent alone, you against the world, holding up your torch, hoping the world will see it. it it's all of us. We were saved not to go solo. We were saved to do this in community. And uh, cling to that. Put that into play. <laughs> you know, let us know when you're hurting. I'm just struck by that, how it's not long ago we got infatuated with my walk, my spiritual growth. We're in this together. We, we can't do this apart. So I want to talk about Christian freedom. Don't worry, you're not a lone wolf. God's not sending you out amongst other wolves by yourself. He's sending you out with a bunch of warriors to wander into the dark and bring the light to a lost and dying generation. And, and the Galatians had a lot of wrong ideas about this, and as bringing it back home where we need to be. They had a, long, a lot of wrong ideas about following Jesus Christ, and they were easily misled because they didn't really have a firm grasp of who he was, and it doesn't sound like they had a firm grasp of what salvation is and, and, and what that looks like for the Christian, what, what that's supposed to be. They were so wandering in their beliefs and so easily misled that Paul wondered if they were actually saved. I think it's uh, chapter 3, verse 10 when he says that. I have to go back and look, three, 10 or 11. He wonders, I, I, I'm mystified about you. I wonder if I've labored over you, over you in vain, he says. So the Galatians wanted to turn back to their own feeble efforts at pleasing God instead of resting in the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ that he won. They also thought being saved meant they weren't going to struggle anymore. In fact, the false teachers, one of the accusations they had against Paul is that he struggled. He's always imprisoned. He's always causing riots. He's always being beaten. How can he be a messenger of God when God won't let him loose, won't let him off the chain? He's always, look, we're the real prophets of God. And for a price, you can have what God's saying to you from us. And we will lead you into truth. You've got to get circumcised. You've got to do all the things the Old Testament told us to do. And Christ is a nice little novelty thing to hang on the outside of your works. The Galatians failed to grasp that walking with Jesus, this side of glory, leads us through a lifetime of spiritual warfare and constant battle for our minds, for our bodies, for our hearts, for our kids, for our spouses, for our families, for the world itself. We are at war. He didn't save us to lay in a hammock and just be fed. That's, uh, being fed is part of it. We should be fed in the church so that we are equipped and we should be fed healthy food in the church. Not fluff, not Twinkies, not Ho-Hos, not sugary, feel better, puffity puff, lollygag around, Skittles and rainbows, sermons. That's not what we're here for. We're here to eat, you know, the bad stuff like we talked about in, in, in Sunday school, broccoli, rice, Spinach, you know, that, that's, that's the meat of the word, the solid milk of the world, word which carries nutrients. That's what we're here for, to be equipped, not to lay around in a hammock and get fat, but to be lean and lithe and to get out into the world and be flexible and in great shape so that we can ward off attacks and so that we can band together and lock our arms and not let the enemy through and so we can advance the gospel into the dark so that we can go into a lost and dying world into the darkness with the light of the gospel and grab hold of sinners and, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, bring them into the kingdom and, and break their chains. That's what we're here for. And we're not... We're pudgy a lot of times, you know? And the Galatians thought we were supposed to be pudgy. False teachers, prosperity gospel proclaimers, are able to, you're supposed to be pudgy. You're supposed to be fat. Your bank account's supposed to be fat. Your table's supposed to be fat. Everything's supposed to be fat and provided for and never worry or want for anything. And that is not the Christian walk. That's not how Jesus walked. That's not how the disciples walked. 
They lived hand to mouth a lot of times, the disciples did. And Jesus lived hand to mouth a lot of times because you will be persecuted if you strive to live righteously. That's why scripture is, tells us about God's armor and constantly warns us to uh, be sober, be alert, be fervent. You know, the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion, lion looking for someone to devour. Be ready, be together, be unified. That's part of it, amen. Isn't that a constant theme of Scripture? Be unified, be of one mind, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Holy Spirit, one message, one gospel, one team, one family, one body. We're the body of Christ, unified. Man, it's, it's all about unity and it's all about the power of God working through us. As we just read, Yahweh is building the elect into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, a holy nation. And we need to know how to wield the sword of the Spirit of God. And we need to know how to wield the, the shield of faith. We need to know how to strap on that belt of truth. We know how to put on the, the, the breastplate of righteousness. We need to know how to fit that helmet of salvation on our head. We have to shoe our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace and, and get out there. Put on the helmet of salvation and go and pray. Pray like a madman. Pray constantly. The very cornerstone of our salvation, listen now, the very cornerstone of our salvation, Brother John just read it, the one we cling to, the one on whom our faith is based, the one on whom our hope is based, the solid rock in the corner of your doubtful mind as to whether or not you're going to get to glory. The, the solid assurance that you are saved and born again and are in the protective hands of God rests in the person and life of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It rests on Him. He is our cornerstone. But to the wicked and the lost, He is a stumbling block. The very thing we count on, they hate and despise and trip over because it, that can't be right in their minds. And that's what we're warring against. But if we're honest, sometimes in our Christian walk and in our Christian lives, this Jesus we cling to in our spirit is a stumbling block in our flesh too. Our sin nature stumbles over the fact that we need to be saved. Our sin nature stumbles over the fact that we are powerless apart from Christ. Our sin nature stumbles over the fact that we cannot live in a way that's even remotely pleasing to God unless it's through the power of the Holy Spirit working through us. We are needy and blind and naked and weak. And we know this in our spirit. But our flesh rebels against that. And that's why we keep trying to go back to the law. You'll feel that constant tension in your Christian walk of trying to go back to the law. It's not just the lost and dying world that loves the law and doing and earning. It's we Christians too. We think, okay, we're saved now. We've got the fire insurance. We're good to go. We're into it with the Holy Spirit. I can take over from here. It's a constant battle in my life. It must also be a constant battle in yours. That's where doubts and fears come from. So today we're going to see that Christian freedom is not free. And we have to consistently fight for it. Not for salvation. Jesus earned that. Amen? That's accomplished. We don't have to fight for salvation. We have to constantly fight to keep our minds, though, and spirits free. And not submit ourselves again to a yoke of slavery to which our flesh wants to go. That's the struggle that you feel. That's the struggle. We're constantly tempted. Now we're going to take a look at five truths. Okay, five truths about genuine salvation and fighting the good fight of faith to maintain our Christian freedom. First, the very first truth, and you have to know this, human sin nature always rebels against Christian freedom. Human sin nature, yours and the lost and dying world who is just, they don't have the Holy Spirit. Their entire nature. But your sin nature constantly rebels against Christian freedom. Let's look at Galatians 5, verses 1 through 4. Galatians 5, verses 1 through 4. For freedom Christ has set us free. Freedom from what? Sin. The penalty for sin. Amen? We're free from the fear of death which dominates the world. 
We Christians should not be afraid to die, maybe how we're going to die, but not the fact that we're going to die. We should not be afraid of what comes next. We're free from sin. We're free from fear. We're free from wondering what happens next. We don't have to worry with any of that. We know God's got us. We know where we're going, and we know the path. It's a narrow one. It's a hard one, but God's got this, and we will not fail, and he will sustain us, and he will carry us through to the end, and we will stand before him on judgment day, righteous and forgiven and justified, and finally, 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 glorified. That is our future, and we know it to be true. We know that to be true. That's what we're free to. We're free to serve the king, baby. We're free to do it. We're free to get up in the morning, dust ourselves off, walk out into the world, free from fear of what the world can bring against us. Don't fear the one that can hurt your body. Free the one that can condemn a soul to hell. And that's not Satan. That's not what that scripture means. That's God. We weren't saved from Satan's wrath. We were saved from God's wrath against sin. Satan's a minor player compared to God. He's a huge player compared to us. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Don't go back to it. Verse 2, look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept, accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accept, accepts circumcision, that's, that's embracing the law, that he is obligated to keep the whole law. If that's you, verse 4, you are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, if that's what you want, you have fallen away from grace. If you want to be justified by your works, Jesus is no use to you. I've said this before. I don't know if all of you were here. I'm going to say it one more time. Jesus did not die on the cross to provide yet another way to heaven. Amen. He didn't come and go through all that so that he could be one of 17 different ways that you could possibly choose to get to glory. That would be stupid, and God's not stupid. Amen? Amen. If there were 15 other ways to get to heaven, Jesus wouldn't die on the cross. He would say, look, there's 15 ways. Why the cross? I don't have to hang on that tree. If there's 15 other ways, there are not 15 ways. There is one way. There's one way. But if you want to submit to, I can do it another way, Jesus is of no use to you. If you're going to try to help him at all, he's of no use to you. Either he accomplished it or he didn't. A halfway savior is no savior at all. Amen? Isn't that true? He got me part of the way and I got to get the rest. That's not saving me. That's pushing me along to the inevitable and maybe I can scratch and crawl the rest of the way. That's not salvation. Salvation is I brought you all the way into the kingdom. There's nothing you can do to lose it. There's nothing you can do to gain it. And there's nothing you can do to make me love you more. Here's the important part. There's nothing you can do to make me love you less. Same. I don't refuse what I have purchased with my own blood. God doesn't return us to sin and Satan thinking that just didn't really work out. There's no receipt. This one didn't quite fit well into the kingdom. I'd like to exchange it for a different one. That's not God. God knew you before he created you. And he saved you. But we struggle. Our human sin nature fights against that. The wicked world, they just do what wicked world does. They have no concept. But we Christians, you want to feel better about yourself? Anyone? Yes? Okay, here we go. Let's go to Romans 7. We're going to, let's go to Romans 7, verse 7. Romans 7, verse 7. When you think of the Apostle Paul, what do you think of? I'll tell you what I think of. I think of Christian rock star. I think this guy, he had it. Man, he, he wrote a lot of the New Testament. He came in late in the game, and God saved him late in the game, but he was like a ball of fire, unstoppable, righteous, knew the stuff. He's writing stuff the other apostles didn't even know. He's, he's telling us things that Jesus has told him personally. I'm personally, and, and so I'm like, wow, this guy's a rock star. Listen to what Paul has to say about his own walk. Romans 7, starting in verse 7 through the first half of verse 8. What then shall we say? That the law is sin by no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had said, you shall not covet. Right? But sin, 
The law is not bad, but sin is. I got a little echo, Justice. If we, is there any way we can knock that down just a skosh, please, if that's possible? Okay, thank you. Um, so I wouldn't have known what sin was unless the law pointed out, so the law is not ba- bad, but verse 8, but sin, my sin nature, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, since God said don't do it, my sin nature said it must be good to do that if God doesn't want us to. Amen, anyone? Producing in me all types of covetousness. All right? The law says don't covet. My sin nature says, oh, it must be great to covet then. And so I covet. The law is not bad. I'm bad. Amen? That, that's, what, that's what Paul's saying. I told you, if, if you cut a hole in a fence and say, don't look through here, no matter what, please, don't look through here. Everyone that walks by that hole in that fence is going to jam their head through that fence to see what's so good that you're trying to hide from them. And that's what we think about God. That's what Eve thought. That's why we're in this jam. That tree looks so good. He said, don't eat of it. I know, if Adam would have just said that, if Adam would have just said, baby, we can't eat of that tree, don't go anywhere near it. We wouldn't be in this pickle. But Adam didn't. And Eve saw that the tree was good and it was appealing and it looked good to eat and it looked beautiful and it was good for knowledge of good and evil. So she took of the tree and she ate because God can't possibly know what he's talking about. It can't possibly be as bad as God said. And that's where we're all at. Let's look at verse 13 of of Romans 7. We're going to read some here, so bear with me. It all has bearing. I tried to edit some out, but we can't stop. Okay, here we go. Ready? Did that which is good, the law, then bring me death to me? By no means. The law didn't bring death. The law demands death, but the law didn't bring it. It was sin. Me breaking the law is what brought death. Produce death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin. And that through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. So when we're telling the world you're sinning, we're doing good. We're, te- we're helping them. We're, we're supposed to do that. Verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. I have a sin nature. Verse 15. I do not understand my own actions. Amen. Who's ever been there before? For I do not do what I want. I do the very thing I hate. Man, that is me. My picture ought to be right there in my Bible. Next to me. I think I'll do that. I'll find a snapshot of me when I was a kid and put it right there. Verse 16. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it's good. So now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Christian, it is your sin nature sinning. You are born again. You are justified. But we are wrapped in this sinful twinkie of flesh around goodness. Verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. The world hates that part. Nothing good dwells in them. I can be a better person. No, you can't. Not apart from Christ. No, you can't. For I have the desire to do what is right. Amen, don't we? Because we have the mind of Christ. We're made in God's image. That's the Imago Dei. That's, we want to do right, but not the ability to carry it out. What did Jesus even say? The flesh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But we have a sin nature. He didn't. We just give in. He didn't. Amen? He didn't. Verse 19. This is the Apostle Paul. This makes me feel so much better about myself. Verse 19. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Praying for the same sins over and over again. Saints, I know, amen. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be, amen, this is the truth. I find this to be a law, that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, amen, especially when we're sitting in church, we're reading it, we're like, hey, we love the word. In my inner being, we love it. But I see in my members, when we leave church, I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Maybe you don't even wait to get out of church to start sinning. I don't know. Maybe you're looking over at your brother that you ought to be forgiven and going, I really hate that guy. I don't know. Maybe you're sinning in here. Could be. Verse 24, Paul and Tim Philkins, wretched man that I am. It's so frustrating to be human, isn't it? Who will deliver me from this body of death? Would we not be hopeless? Verse 25, thank you, Lord, there's a verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, 
I myself serve the law of God with my mind. I want to be a good Christian. I want to obey. But with, the, with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Folks, it is an eternal struggle. Once you are born again, you will not stop having the urge to sin, the desire to sin, the drive to sin. In fact, that drive may even increase. Because you now, now you know it's sin, and you know what that does to us. When we know it's sin, you know what that does to us. Even Moses, he refused to take the pleasures of sin for a season. Sin is pleasurable for a season, and that's what we get attracted to. Mercy sakes. We're a mess, amen? We're just a mess. But Jesus isn't. <laughs> so you can go back to Galatians now. So Galatians 5, we're going to be in verse 5 in a second. So our old self and our new self will always be in conflict. So we can't always focus on the here and now. That cannot be our primary focus, which leads us to the second thing. The second truth regarding Christian freedom is true Christianity means playing the long game. Having an eternal view of what's going on. If the Christian just focuses on how successful I am at defeating sin in my own strength, I'm going to think of myself as a pitiful Christian loser, can't get it done, doesn't even deserve to share my faith, let alone walk out of the house and share my faith. Why? I'm such a, what, hypocrite. If that's your focus, yeah, you are. you got to have the long view. The long view. Let's look at Galatians 5, 5, and 6. Listen, this is it. Paul's telling him. He's breaking it down. Here we go. For through the Spirit, Holy Spirit, should be capitalized in your Bible, by faith, we ourselves eagerly await for the hope of righteousness. I don't expect to be perfectly righteous now. But I expect then when I'm glorified, I will be, amen, perfectly righteous. That's where Jesus has taken me. There are no U-turns on this road. He is taking me to righteousness. But I don't put the unrealistic expectation on myself now that I'll never sin. That would be ridiculous. I would be beating myself up. Here we go. I'm going to have you turn again. We're going to go to Philippians. I think that's the last time we go anywhere. All right. Philippians 3.18. It should be a couple pages to your right. Go right. Philippians 3.18. We play the long game. Jesus is eternal. Our righteousness is eternal. We will be righteous and holy before Him for eternity. It's a, it's a long, long game. Philippians 3.8. Philippians 3 and 8. Philippians 3, starting in verse 8. Listen to this. This is gold. It's gold. And you get it today for free. Amen. Here we go. Philippians 3, 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss. This is the temporal view. Short, this is the short game. Paul's talking about the short game here. Indeed, I count everything as loss here in the short game because of the surpassing worth, long game, of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, short game, in order that I may gain Christ, long game, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, amen, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, not my actions. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that long game by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. We're going to keep going. Not that I've already obtained this. That's important to know. If you have an underline in your Bible, that's a good time now to do so. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. Amen. We've got to tell ourselves that. But I press on. Long game. I press on to make it my own perfection because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, here it is, guys, here's how we live in the short game world. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the long game for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. We have attained righteousness, but it's out there. We're, we're, we're headed to it. Our life on earth should be long game, focused forward. Verse 20, finally, last. Because why? Our citizenship is in heaven. From it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are playing the long game. True Christianity means having an eternal view 
of where we are, what we're doing, what's coming next, even what happened in the past. If we have an eternal view of the Old Testament, it starts to make sense to us. Short term, it doesn't. All right, that's the second thing. True Christianity means playing the long game. Let's get to the third thing. And we're going to go back to Galatians 5, verse 7. A drive within you to focus on the short game is never from Yahweh and will always fail. Right? That pressure you feel to have the end-all be-all, your life here and what you're doing here, that pressure you feel to make it all about now and what you can gain here and what you can do here and your legacy and, your li and all that stuff, it, it, that guilt that you feel over not a, that's never from the Lord. He never intended us to focus solely or primarily here. Let's look at Galatians 5, 7 through 10. You were running well. Running well where? Towards the end, the long game. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Who? This persuasion, verse 8, is not from him who calls you. <laughs> your focus on your failures is not from God. That did not come from him. Verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Isn't that true? If you start to doubt yourself in one area, doesn't it just pick up speed? Doesn't it get bigger and bigger? And you start to doubt God here and doubt God there and doubt you here. And, and all this, it just builds. And pretty soon you're living a life riddled with guilt. Verse 10, I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. All right, so it's about the long game. Now, Jesus will improve our short game, our walk on earth. He, he will do that. But our focus should be on him and eternity and all while we're doing that, loving the people around us. Those whose minds are set primarily on the temporal, on works of the flesh, will perish. How many times, saint, have you sacrificed time with the Lord to go do something of no value? My response to that, if someone asked me, that would be, you mean yesterday or forever? Because yesterday I can probably not even count on both hands, the times that I could have spent with the Lord or spent in prayer that I was just focused on other things. The intimacy with which we know some of the characters in our favorite TV show is so much greater than the intimacy with which we know the Lord. Why is that? Because we spend a lot of time focusing on that TV show or that thing, and not a lot of time focusing on the Lord. It just becomes important to us. Right? It's our... our our perspective is in the wrong place. But Paul's mentioned this in Philippians. It should be up on the screen for you here. Philippians 3, 17 through 19. What should we do? What should we do? Brothers, join in imitating me. We should find saints in the church that walk uprightly and imitate their faith. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Here's a question for us, a rhetorical question you don't even need to look up. Are you a person in this fellowship that other young men and young women can look up to and say, that's how I should walk? Think about that. Are others looking to you going, that's it. I want to be like that. That guy's got it. That's who we want to be. And if you're hurting and you don't know where to turn, I, I challenge you. Find men in this fellowship who are walking with Jesus and emulate their walk. There are good men here following Christ. There are strong women... This church, I don't know if you appreciate it. I don't know if you know it. I do. I've been in a lot of different churches and I've stood in a lot of different pulpits and I'm here to tell you, we have mature, strong, bold, beautiful in the Lord women of Christ in this fellowship. They are prayer warriors. They know the word better than I do. They, they know it backwards and forwards. Uh, they, they are strong women of faith, yet they defer and allow us clunky men to be in charge of things. But we're not all dumb clunky men. This fellowship is rich with men who love Jesus Christ, who are devoted to the Word of God, who are devoted to their families, devoted to their wives, devoted to this church. You, would, you should be proud to emulate three-quarters of the guys in this church the way they carry themselves and walk with integrity in that world right out there. This is a place to raise your children. This fellowship right here is a place to be. This is a I don't want you to get a big head, get a bigger head, can't get through the door, I understand. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus Christ is doing work in this fellowship. I don't know if you see it, but I sure do. And in my daily prayers, I am grateful for the men and women God is raising up in this church. Folks, churches don't have a men's group like we have. Right? Am I lying? 
Am I Wolfman Jack? If I'm lying, I'm dying. If, 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 if we have 16, 20 guys sitting around a table on a Saturday learning the Word of God. That does not happen in churches our size. That does not happen in churches five times our size. The Holy Spirit is at work here. The women of faith in this church are unified. They are prayer warriors. They are leading out. They are doing... Man, we better be on our unicycle because they're moving. we got to stay ahead. we got to stay ahead. We are all with our eyes on the prize for the glory of Christ, straining forward. And if you're not of that ilk, if you're not, stay here. Learn how to. I'm, I'm telling you. According to the example you have in us, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears. And he's talking about Jews. Religious Jews. They walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. If your mind is set on earthly things primarily or exclusively, that's not of the Lord. When the Lord's at work, your mind will start to shift and you will start to focus on the things of the kingdom and on the king of that kingdom. All right. So a drive to focus on the short term is never from Yahweh. Let's look at the fourth thing. The sin nature hates the cross and persecutes those who trust in it. The sin nature hates the cross and persecutes those who trust in it. Did I tell you we weren't going anywhere else? We are. I just up there. Apologize. Galatians 5.11. But if I, brother, still preach circumcision, in other words, if I'm still preaching the law, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. What Paul is saying is, if I've started preaching the law instead of grace, why am I being persecuted? If the law is what matters and I'm preaching the law just like they are, why am I being persecuted? No, I'm being persecuted because of the offense of the cross. When the offense of the cross is removed, the church stops being persecuted. Think about that. Think of the lap of luxury we live in in this country, in our church, without persecution. Not real persecution. Lord, God, please, in your infinite mercy, never let our lack of persecution be because we have removed the offense of the cross of Jesus Christ. If we endure a season and live through a season of a lack of persecution, let it be because your grace is on us and you're giving us opportunity, not because we've been negligent with the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ. The, the word there for offense is scandalon. You can hear in it the word scandalous. All right? it's, it's the same word that we use in Peter for stumbling block. The cross of Jesus Christ. Penal, substitutionary atonement for your sins. Vicarious righteousness. The righteousness that Christ gives you runs so counter to the sin nature, and so counter to religion that it causes people to stumble over it and rebel against it. Your sin nature doesn't want to admit that you're a sinner and Christ is the only way. Your sin nature doesn't want to admit that Jesus Christ had to pay your price for you and take that wrath for you, otherwise you would never be able to bear it. Your sin nature does not want to admit that he is, you are helpless and He is the only way. The sin nature hates the cross of Christ and persecutes those who trust in it. They are offended because they're culpable. They're offended because they're guilty. They're offended because God has the right to punish them for eternity. They are scandalized by by the fact that they cannot possibly work their way out of hell and into heaven. They're scandalized by the fact that there is hell. They're scandalized by the fact that there's a God who would send people to hell, even though it's just. They're scandalized. My God would never do that. Who's ever heard that before? A loving God would never send people to hell. Who's ever heard that before? That is not the God of the Bible. A loving God must send people to hell. Because don't tell me you're loving if you don't hate evil. 
Don't tell me how much you love that person if you're willing to sacrifice them to the fires of hell because you don't love them enough to say something and confront them with their sin. Don't tell me how much you love if you don't stand against evil. It's the mantra of this age. Silence is violence. I hate the context in which that's used, but it's true. If you see evil and don't say anything, you may as well participate. If we love the lost and dying world, we must confront sin. They don't need a savior if they don't know that they sin. The world doesn't need a helper to get them the last six inches to glory. They are an eternity away from the glory as far as east is from the west. And if we don't say something, they're going to die that way. And they're going to perish. Our own sin natures also scandalize us, though. Uh, they rebel against these gospel truths. That's why we tend to doubt our salvation. That's why we tend to try and work for it, even though we know we're saved. Those, those sneaking doubts. So how do we fight that? Quickly. How do we fight that? How do you fight those sneaking doubts? How do you let your regenerate nature win and your sin nature lose? How do you make your sin nature, your sin nature weaker than your regenerate nature, your new nature? Well, there's some basic elementary principles of the world that work here. If you don't feed a dog, it won't win the fight. Right? Who's the stronger in the fight? The dog you feed. Starve your sin nature. Edify and feed your spiritual nature, your new nature. Daily be in the Word of God. Turn off the TV for a minute and open up the Psalms. Turn the computer off for just a second. I'm not... The Word of God is so powerful, you don't have to go time for time. You don't have to do eight hours in the Word to fight off eight hours in the world. It doesn't work that way. You spend half an hour in the Word and in prayer, you're equipped. All right? The Word is so much stronger than the world. God doesn't ask us to spend 16 hours in the Word to be equipped. He just put me first. Pray without ceasing, certainly. Meditate on the Word day and night, but that's in your mind. You don't have to have the book open study in that time. Starve the dog that wants to win, which is your sin nature. Be in the Word. Be in prayer. Be in fellowship. It's so simple. Three things. Three steps. Feed the right dog. Feed your spirit. So we have to constantly have our minds awash in, in the Word and constantly awash in prayer in order to win. And, but when our sin nature is offended, it casts doubts on our salvation. But for the lost and dying world, on the heels of offense comes what? Persecution. Paul knew this, and he wrote in 2 Timothy 3. He wrote this to Timothy. 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 11. And this is what we have to know is coming. We have to understand this. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. Steadfastness. I'm thinking of lunch already. <laughs> my steadfastness. Look at that sentence right there that I... You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, and my love. Men in the church, are we demonstrating this to the young men in the church? Can they follow our teaching? Can they follow our conduct? Do they know what our aim in life is and can they follow it? Do we talk to more of them how to be good businessmen than about how to be good Christians? My faith is my faith. Worth following? My patience? Uh-oh. Why do you have to throw that one in there? My patience? Patience with false teachers? Patience with your enemy? Patience with your loved ones? My love? My steadfastness? Men, are we demonstrating, and ladies, men, are we demonstrating this? We better be because my persecutions come next. And sufferings. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil people won't be. Evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. They're going to be living the life of Riley. It's we Christians that suffer persecution. They don't suffer persecution. They are glorified in their apostasy. They are in their sin and their decadence and in their adherence to sinful things. They're glorified. It. They're lifted up as spiritual giants because they have the courage to be sinful. It's shameful, but they don't know that. We do. And they're going to persecute us for pointing it out. We Christians will battle internally 
And we will battle externally against sin nature as long as we live on the earth. But we are not crushed. Amen? And we're not defeated. And we're not destroyed. Because the fifth thing. The long game focus, when we're focused on the long game, helps our short game. <laughs> you don't focus on the short game, you'll all focus on the long game. If we focus on the long game, it helps our short game. Guess what? That's by God's design. He didn't want us focused on the earth, he wants us focused on him. And when we focus on him, he improves our short game. Amen. It's just so true. It's so true. Galatians 5:13. For you were called the freedom, brothers. But like I started the message, I'm going to end with the same thing. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to act the fool. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. We are free to serve Christ. We are free to serve one another. We are not free to act the fool. But, listen, if you bite and devour each other, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. There's a whole sermon on that verse, and I, and I won't do a whole sermon on that verse. My friend used to say, nothing hurts like a sheep bite. And uh, it's because churches can hurt you. You love these people, and, they, and you think they've stabbed you in the back, and you're hurt. You see to it that you're not devoured by a, a Christian who's being disobedient. You see to it. It's one of the maddening things about Scripture. When I've sinned against someone, Matthew 18, it's up to me. To go to them. When someone sinned against me in Scripture, it's up to me to go to them. I'm not responsible for other people's spiritual walk. I'm responsible for my spiritual walk. It's always on me to be the bigger man, to take the step, to go out and do it. It's always that way, and it's that way for each and every one of us. And if all of us were living that way, we would so be, be so busy coming to each other with things that we would never, we, uh, that root of bitterness would never develop. Everything would be on the table. Everything would be out open. There wouldn't be a fence that's stored up that I'm just not going to say anything. I'm just going to wait for them to apologize to me. And then five years later, you haven't said anything to that person, and you hate each other. Or that person's so confused as to why you haven't spoken in five years and, and they just assume that you hate them and they don't even know what the offense is. That's not how the body of Christ is supposed to be. You see to it that you're not devoured by other Christians. Go to them. Confront the problem. Deal with the issue. In love. There's five things. There's five things. Christian freedom, freedom isn't free. We have to fight for it. We have to stand up and not be fat baby Christians laying in a hammock. We have to stand up and get in the Word of God, wield the sword of God, and get moving and shed that baby fat and get out there and live the Christian life. Stumble, fall, keep moving forward. The Lord will pick you up and you're going to be in great shape at the end of it all. But not if we just sit still and get fed all day, every day. We're just going to get fed. We've got to put it to use. So we just saw five truths about genuine Christianity and, and, and genuine Christian freedom. And next week we're going to see the how. How do we fight the good fight of faith? That's coming next week. And it has to do with walking in the Spirit.